Good afternoon, I'm Richard Lackumet, the Dean of the School of Strategic Land Power, and today it's my great honor to introduce our panel presentation on large-scale ground combat operations. The 2017 National Security Strategy emphasizes the need for the U.S. military to renew capabilities and that the joint force must provide the ability to fight and win across any plausible conflict that threatens U.S. vital interests. This includes restoring the readiness of our forces for major war. For the past five years, we've used the 1990-91 Gulf War as a vehicle to explore the main themes of our curriculum in the context of a specific war. This year, we're fortunate to host a panel of strategic leaders who are veterans of that war. These seasoned leaders have developed great wisdom over years of dedicated service and stewardship in and out of uniform and are here today to help us place key dynamics of the Gulf War in context and perspective. I'll provide a brief introduction of all four panelists, after which General Franks will open up the presentation. The detailed biographies for each of our panelists have been posted to Blackboard for, your, for you to read, if you wish, in more detail. Lieutenant General Retired Paul Funk completed a distinguished Army career as Commanding General, Third Corps, and Fort Hood. Other prominent assignments, uh, prominent assignments included Commanding General National Training Center, Vice Director, J3 Joint Staff, Commander of the U.S. Army Armor Center, and combat service in Vietnam. His combat awards include the Distinguished Flying Cross, two Bronze Stars, several Air Medals, and Army Commendation Medals for Valor. Since retirement, he has served more than eight years at the Institute for Advanced Technology, University of Texas, Austin. He holds bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degrees from Montana State University and is a graduate of the U.S. Army War College. During the Gulf War, as a major general, he commanded the U.S. 3rd Armored Division. Lieutenant General Retired Thomas Rehm completed a Distinguished Army career as the Director, Defense Security Assistance Agency. Other prominent military assignments included Chief, U.S. Military Training Mission Saudi Arabia, and two combat tours in Vietnam. His combat awards include two Silver Stars, the Bronze Star for Valor, and two other awards of the Bronze Star. Since retirement, he has been an active public servant to include serving as the Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the U.S. Army War College Foundation. He holds a bachelor's degree from Louisiana State University, a master's degree from Syracuse University, and is a graduate of the U.S. Army War College. During the Gulf War, as a major general, he commanded the U.S. 1st Infantry Division. General retired John Tolelli completed a distinguished Army career as the Commander-in-Chief, United Nations Command, Combined Forces Command, and U.S. Forces Korea. Other prominent military assignments included Vice Chief of Staff, U.S. Army, Commander, U.S. Army Forces Command, Commander 7th Army Training Command and Combat Duty in Vietnam during two tours. His combat awards include the Bronze Star for Valor and two additional Bronze Stars. He is the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer Emeritus of Cyprus International. In addition to his current position, since retirement from the Army, he has served as President and CEO of USO Worldwide Operations. He holds a bachelor's degree from Pennsylvania Military College, now Widener University a master's degree from Lehigh University, honorary doctorates from Widener University and the University of Maryland, served as an assistant professor of military science at Lafayette College, and is a graduate of the U.S. Army War College. During the Gulf War, as a major general, he commanded the U.S. 1st Cavalry Division. General retired Fred Franks completed a distinguished Army career as the Commander, U.S. Training and Doctrine Command. His other prominent military assignments include Commander, 1st Armored Division, Director, Joint Staff, J-7, Deputy Commandant, U.S. Army Command and General Staff College, Commanding General, 7th Army Training Command, and Combat Duty in Vietnam, where wounds he sustained cost him a leg. His combat awards include the Silver Star, the Distinguished Flying Cross, the Bronze Star for Valor, two Purple Hearts, as well as several Air Medals and Army Commendation Medals for Valor. Since retirement, he has been an active advocate of soldiers who have been wounded, both physically and or mentally. He has served as Chair of the American Battle Monuments Commission and as a member of the Defense Health Board. He has also held an academic chair at the Simon Center for Professional Military Ethic at West Point for more than 16 years to include valuable support to the Future of the Army Profession Project, one of the key pu publications of which was part of your student issue. He holds bachelor's degrees from West Point, master's degrees in English and philosophy from Columbia University, served as an assistant professor in the West Point Department of English, and is a graduate of the National War College. He is co-author with Tom Clancy of the book Into the Storm, A Study in Command. During the Gulf War, as Lieutenant General, he commanded U.S. 7th Corps. Please join me in a warm U.S. Army War College welcome for our panelists.
Well, thank you very much, Dean Plakamont, uh, General Kim, members of the Army War College class of uh, 2020. Congratulations to all of you for your selection to be here. It would be a great and wonderful year and opportunity for you to, to grow as military professionals. Particularly a warm welcome to the United States of America, to all our international officers here in the class, uh, and to your families. We are pleased to be here and to share some thoughts with you on large ground scale combat operations. I'd like to start off, next slide please, show you uh, different views of this panel. There's uh, General Tom Rame on the 24th, first day of our attack, 24th February 1991, uh, giving me a quick uh, sit rep on the progress of his breach of the Iraqi uh, uh, complex obstacle system. Next. There's with General Butch Funk, commanding 3rd Armored Division, the afternoon of the 25th of February, giving me an assessment of his progress and uh, an important assessment before our left hook uh, turn into the Iraqi Republican Guard. Behind him is Gene Blackwell, assistant division commander. Next. Uh, Don Holder's not here today. General Holder commanded the 2nd Armored Cavalry Regiment. There's a corps commander going forward to listen to his covering force commander and intelligence that he's uncovered in his advance toward the Republican Guards. Next. There's General John Tulele right here. As we are discussing the final maneuver I'll talk about in a few seconds here uh, with uh, Colonel Holder there uh, on his right, as we are discussing the feasibility of, of that particular sequel to our uh, left hook uh, turning movement. Now, if, uh, if we agree on anything, and we agree on a lot, it's that one of the vital keys of success of large-scale ground combat operations is face-to-face -face command in combat, out on the battlefield, getting assessments from your commander, getting their views, seeing the battlefield with your own eyes, face-to-face, -face, no substitute for that. Get out of your command post. So that, that's, the, that's the first point here as we talk about this this afternoon. I don't like the, uh, there's a term called battlefield circulation. I don't like that term personally. I think that's more of a social term where you're trying to get to know people at a social event. This is not a social activity, as you know. This is battle. This is command. You owe it to your soldiers to get out there and see it for yourself and talk to your subordinate commander. Next. Okay, large ground, large scale ground combat operations. You're never going to go in a configuration you are in peacetime. Here was 7th Corps in Germany. Here was 7th Corps in Desert Storm. 76,000, 146,000. One division from 7th Corps in the Cold War. Added 3rd Armored from 5th Corps. We added the Big Red One from Fort Riley, Kansas. We added the 1st Cavalry Division later from Fort Hood, Texas. And then the 1st British Armored Division Brigades four and seven from the UK and from Germany. So a lot of team building going on. Four artillery brigades, sizable organization, a lot of count talent, depth of leadership, a great team. But a lot of team building has to go on. That's the first thing you do. Assignment of missions. Who gets what mission in this new configuration? Next. Then a lot of concurrent activity with deployment and so forth. One of the first things you want to decide, it takes a lot of energy from your senior staff, is where to place forces on the ground. You want to do that in conjunction with the theater uh, security, OPSEC, deception scheme, but you also want to do it where you put forces on the ground in a similar configuration to that they're going to be in uh, in your offensive operation. And so here we had the Big Red One along with the 1st British Armored Division. 1st British Armored would pass through the Big Red One after their successful breach. We knew we would have the 1st and 3rd Armored Division side by side in 
our envelopment and in our attack against the Republican Guard. The only thing I got wrong was, I'll show you in a little bit, I had to cross over the two divisions in our, uh, in our rehearsal. I'll show you that in a few seconds. Critically important, time to train. You don't want to get a better idea about a week later and want to move these large organizations somewhere else. Get it right uh, the first time. Next. You want to look at the enemy set. Here's uh, five frontline Iraqi infantry divisions. They had an armor division and tactical reserve. This was so-called Iraqi 7th Corps, as it turns out. And then we had the Republican Guards and other units, so-called Jihad Corps, 10th and 12th Armor Division, and the 17th Armor Division, three Iraqi uh, Republican Guards uh, Division. That was our point of main effort. That was our mission, to destroy the Republican Guards in our sector of attack. Next. Commander's intent. Commander's intent, as you know, is the collective will of the organization, whatever organization you're talking about, be it a company or be it a corps. You get a lot of advice on this. You get advice from your fellow commanders, great advice. You get it from your staff. You even get feedback from your soldiers. But in the end, I believe, firmly believe, this is commander's business and the commander has to do this themselves. I brought along with me, and I showed it to one of the seminars this morning, my own uh, handwritten uh, commander's intent. Uh, written in pencil, with a lot of strike overs. So I really believe this is the commander's business. That's reinforced as one of those enduring values in uh, Field Marshal William Slim's book, Defeat in a Victory, where he says in the order, there were a lot of people who could do that order a lot better than he could but one part he paid attention to, and that was the intention. What is the expressed will of that organization, in his case, the 14th Army in Burma? Commander's intent. Do it yourself. Next. Then you want to do rehearsals as you, as you can and have you, as you have the space to do it. So we noticed from our tactical assembly areas to our attack positions, and at this point, General Talele's 1st Cavalry Division was placed under the operational control of 7th Corps, and we placed them up here in order to stop any preemptive attack the Iraqis might do uh, to interrupt our, our own preparations, as they had done uh, over in the, the eastern part of, uh, of Saudi Arabia and, and Kuwait. So we, we noticed that we could move 180 kilometers in the same Exact configuration, except as I said, I had, a, I had a cross over the 1st and 3rd Armored Division to get in that configuration. Put the 2nd ACR out front and then move in that same configuration and a lot of good things go on in that kind of a rehearsal and get into our attack position. We also had an engineer battalion for General Tom Rame construct an exact replica of the Iraqi defensive a complex optical system. Big Red One do the breach, and the Brits pass through the Big Red One, and General Rame and General Rupert Smith, commander of the 1st British Armored Division, work out all the details of that in our movement over to our attack position. Next. Then you want to put together a campaign plan. You want to arrange battles and engagements in sequence or simultaneously that leads you to complete successfully your own particular mission you've been assigned, in our case, destruction of the Iraqi Republican Guards in our sector, and consistent with the overall, nested with the overall campaign plan of Third Army uh, and of the theater. And so for our, our, own, uh, our own campaign plan consisted first of feints and demonstrations by the 1st Cavalry Division here in some sharp contact to deceive the Iraqis that we were coming up this direction towards Kuwait City, when in fact we were coming over here about 120 kilometers to the west. It consisted of a breach of the Iraqi complex obstacle system by the 1st Infantry Division, followed on by the 
1st British Armored Division passing through and attacking this tactical reserve, which we didn't want to get, uh, allow them, even if they were trying to get out of the theater, to run into our logistics tail as this envelopment force uh, moved towards the Republican Guard. Then we had a movement of the 2nd Armored Cavalry Regiment as a core covering force and the enveloping forces of the 1st and 3rd Armored Divisions coming around from the left. All of that going on simultaneously. We had our logistics established log base echo here. We had two artillery brigades in addition to the artillery of the 1st British Armored and the Big Red One fire a 30 minute as opposed to two hours uh, prep uh, in the breach. We were going to fire two hours and then we got ordered to go early at 1500 on the 24th. So they fired a 30 minute prep, about 5,500 cannon rounds and about a little over 400 uh, rockets. Next. Then a, a movement, the, those two artillery brigades moved on their own cross country, caught up with their two brigades. They were in direct support. The 142nd went with the Brits. The 75th Artillery Brigade went with the 1st Armored Division. We had told the, our G2 and our primary intelligence requirements that we needed to know by the afternoon of the second day what the Republican Guards were going to do or they predicted they were going to do, confirmed by those discussions I had with General Funk and General Holder that they were going to defend about right where they were, which then we had developed seven options, seven branches, if you will, from our basic plan, and we selected Frag Plan 7, which was the one that turned 7th Corps 90 degrees to the right in a, what we called later a left hook, the correct military term would be a turning movement of 1st and 3rd Armored Divisions and as it turned out, the 1st uh, Infantry Division, who after the breach, moved forward and joined them uh, online. Next. That armored mass assault of the Big Red One, the 3rd Armored, and the 1st Armored Division, 1st UK defeating that 52nd Armored and continuing their attack east to Highway 8, Then what do you do next? What's the sequel to that attack? Well, we wanted to see if we couldn't envelop the remaining Republican guards in our sector, which uh, consisted of a portion of the Hammurabi division before they escaped uh, out of theater. And so when the 1st Cavalry Division was placed under operational control out of CENTCOM Reserve, on the third morning of the third day, the 26th, I asked John Tilley to move his division from where they had been on up here to AA Horse and be prepared to be the northern arm of that envelopment and the big red one to be the southern arm of the envelopment. And meanwhile, conducting deep attacks with our 11th uh, Aviation Brigade here uh, on in front of the attacking 1st Infantry Division. General Tilley moved that, his division some 300 kilometers in, in about 24 hours, 300 kilometers plus in 24 hours. The, we were in the process of executing that uh, envelopment when the uh, ceasefire occurred at 0800 on the morning of uh, 28 uh, September, uh, correction, February. Next, please. I'll go back one, please. Uh, you see this log base in Elegan. Uh, in that intent, it said, combat service support must keep up because we intend no pausing. On their own, on their own initiative, our core support command that in Germany had been about 7,500 soldiers and expanded to over 26,000 soldiers, mainly from the United States Army National Guard and the United States Army Reserve, established a log base here of 1.25 million gallons of fuel so that it would cut the turnaround time of our enveloping divisions in half 
so they could do two turnarounds to continue to refuel and that this was an attack with no pauses, a rolling turning movement attack. Actually at, at night, the evening of the 26th, we had nine armor brigades online in that uh, left hook attack. Next. So for us, it was 89 hours, 250 kilometers. I think we did about every offensive maneuver that was in, the, in our doctrine manuals. We weren't doing that to go off a checklist. That's just what the mission required. And it's a testament to these gents, commanded divisions, and to all our subordinate commanders and soldiers that they could execute every one of those flawlessly, from feints and demonstrations to penetration maneuver, breach of a complex obstacle system, to an envelopment maneuver, to hasty frontal attacks, to a core turning movement, to uh, about half of a, of a double envelopment that did not get completed. Here were the results. Here were our numbers. 89 hour consumption. I coined a phrase, forget logistics in this type of operation and you lose. You cannot be successful. And destruction of Iraqi forces. Final slide. Actually, this slide was from a briefing that we, we took, I, I took from listening to after action reviews from all of our commanders, put this together, got everybody's agreement on it. This is the one we, we did 28 years ago, and I haven't changed a word in it since. Air, we used 348 close air support strikes, mainly in the daylight, mainly with A-10. And we had plenty of help from the Air Force, deep and in interdiction. Deception, I mentioned that. Training, rehearsal. We were the product of 15 years of intensive, win the first battle of the next war, fight outnumbered and win, fight close and deep simultaneously. Three editions of 100-5. Combat Training Center, intense training. National Training Center, JRTC, Hohenfeld, CMTC. We were the products of that. Lived it. Lived that training ethos, trained and ready. Relentless attack of the enemy. Accurate read of the battlefield. Adjusting. Adjusting plan. Creating those branches and sequels as you attack in continuous operation. Not stopping the plan, but continuous planning seeing the close fight and the next fight simultaneously. Logistics, and in the bottom line, teamwork and skilled, tough soldiers and leaders who took the fight to the enemy under all conditions. And I remain as proud and humbled today as I was then to have had the privilege to command and lead this magnificent organization and serve with these great commanders before you today. So thank you very much, and I'll turn it now over to General Funk. General Franks has set the, the tone uh, for this entire briefing, but let me, let me highlight a couple of things. First of all, it did take us about 15 years to build that army from sort of the the wreck of uh, Vietnam in many ways. Some our fault, some our senior leaders' fault. Plenty of blame to go around for that one, but also a heck of a lot of plaudits for the soldiers that fought it. Uh, maybe we let them down as leaders sometimes, but they never let us down. What I would say about that is, is the intense training that we had focused on, and in fact that everywhere we went, it was kind of a discussion of the war fighting business. Uh, everybody was pretty proud of that, pretty focused on it, and it showed on this battlefield. I will tell you this, it is true that uh, I sat uh, not for not too long at the line of departure as we were getting ready to cross into Iraq, and I'm thinking to myself, it is true what all the guys from the Second World War in Korea said. Uh, when you get to this point, 
it's not going to be the generals that are going to make things happen. It's going to be the soldiers and the fighting units and the units that support them that make it happen. The guys and gals, increasingly with the short swords, that are going to win or lose this fight. The general might be able to screw it up, but he can't win it. If we hadn't trained them, if we weren't ready, then maybe we would end up in the shape that some of our own correspondents and pundits back in this country were saying at the time, we're going to bang up against the blooded Iraqi army, eight and a half years fighting Iranians and so on, and we're going to get our clocks cleaned and that equipment, like the Abrams with the turbine engine, is all going to quit in the desert. Ha! It didn't. We didn't. And the kids fought magnificently. So I'm thinking, all right, what do I, I'm going to go wherever there are problems. Sort of the senior leader's job as well as all the things that General Franks talked about. But I'm going to go right to the sound of the gun, is the old phrase that still pertains. Still pertains in this war, in these wars. I want to tell you, almost nothing went wrong, folks. I don't think we'll ever fight another war that successfully. And that's not bragging about me or any other of, of the senior guys. It is bragging about the young people that really did the fighting and the killing and whatever dying there was. And I'll tell you this, I'm sorry to say I had more people die in the troop I commanded, the Air Cavalry Troop in Vietnam, by far than I did in an entire division in Desert Storm. And it wasn't that the Republican guards were so bad. They fought hard, frankly. It's that our kids were so good. We shouldn't ever forget that. and We shouldn't ever forget what we owe them for preparing them in that manner. When I came out of the end, I never learned as much in my whole career as I learned at one time as being commander of the National Training Center. That privilege to go see a fight every day and it was almost every day of the year. We only had one day off then. That was Christmas Day. I learned a tremendous amount about what it would take on that battlefield. As it turned out, it did. So all that preparation that you all have been through, and as you go on and become the senior commanders of tomorrow, it's going to stand you in good stead. And it's about the people. A lot of it's about organizations and equipment and everything else, but the first and most important point is the people, the soldiers, and your leadership. I think that was borne out in Desert Storm, clearly. Second thing I would say, all right, if nothing goes wrong, then what are we going to do next and how are we going to prepare for the next fight? And in our case, in 3rd Armored Division, uh, the readiness rates were terrific. We were still at 92% on, on the Abrams. I think every single Apache, we had the two battalions or two, two squadrons in. All of them were flying. We'd had lost some Bradleys due to fire. But everything was in pretty good shape, except we were pretty tired at the time when we culminated this fight. But, but that culmination was... And I don't know if people still read the book that General Stoft and friends put together called America's First Battles. If you do, you'll recall that 11 of the 13 were defeats, pretty severe defeats of our army. In this first battle, we absolutely overwhelmed the enemy, and we didn't have to fight a second one. So there ought to be for everybody, including all the politicians down south of here, there ought to be a lesson in that. And there ought to be a lesson in all commanders at every level to prepare your people every day to do the very best they can in the fight you may be charged with. The combat power ratios are a lot different in the Army today. We were blessed to have what we had. And if anybody thought Saddam Hussein was a great military genius, he picked the wrong time to tempt President Bush to send the U.S. Army, and the rest of the U.S. forces at him because we were at the height of our performance. And then, of course, we began taking the Army down, as you all know, because you lived through it, many of you. So from my standpoint, working hard, we had just come out of a cycle in Germany where we went to Graf, everybody fired, qualified, etc. went to Hohenfels, every single task force trained in that atmosphere, 
And then we started putting equipment on barges and everything else. The thing that I don't know if we can do today, and you all are going to have to answer this, is to support these kinds of operations logistically. As an example, when we got ready to deploy, I asked for quite a few things, but the thing that I got that stood out the most from the USURE staff at the time was an extra 38 5,000 gallon fuel tankers. Second or third night of the war, General Franks called me and asked me if we could give up some fuel for somebody else. And every single one of my subordinate commanders and my DISCOM commander uh, said, no, we can't give up that gas. <laughs> we need it. We had planned for, by the way, we started planning, I think, on the 3rd of August. We had no idea we'd go do this. But we thought it would be a good idea to train and plan for that. We figured we'd burn a million gallons of gas a day. We only burned 653,000 gallons a day, I believe. And you saw the results on General Franks' slide of what we all burned. That, that extra 38 5,000 gallon tankers was a kind of a lifesaver. And it really made a difference. All that planning, all that effort, and all that work on logistics paid off is what I'm telling. If you're a heavy division commander, you better understand something about logistics. You may not be a qualified logistician, but you better know what kind of, have a sense of what you need, and your guys better understand, even if it requires a cudgel here and there, uh, that, that they got to be ready to support the guys forward. That lesson of that war is one that's, pretty important today. I'm not sure that you have the force structure and even the knowledge and practice to do those kinds of things. I know you're capable. I just don't know if we've given you enough tools. Those are the kinds of things that I think, that I think really pertain from the standpoint of 3rd Armed Division and my experience there. And it's also very humbling to think of all those young people that went forward and had confidence in us confidence to take those orders. And by the way, we did rehearse three times, the battle command plan as well as movements. And the last time, we didn't have to change hardly anything. Preparation pays off. Sweat does have some equity on that kind of a battlefield. All right, I'm going to turn this over to my friend Tom Rame now, and he's going to talk to you about the Big Red One. Thanks. I want to stay here in my uh, hold down position. Uh, General Franks described the mission, and I remember complete and passing the uh, British and uh, receiving a message from him. It says, move the division forward and take up a reserve position. Got it. So the next morning we took off. About three quarters of the way there, the radio comes on and it's Danger 6. This is Jayhawk 6. I want you to pass through the second ACR and I want you to take up an engagement with the Republican Guard. Got it. We'll do it. It's 2200 at night and we're moving. The division is moving. Two brigades up and one back. I'm, I'm telling you this because it'll sort of define some of the things later. And we started that engagement in a very target rich environment at 2200 hours that night. The final mission, he didn't tell you that after the war was over and a ceasefire was declared, he asked me to go seize this place called South Juan so we could have ceasefire talks. <laughs> so we did that too. I would start by talking to you about an intelligence estimate of, the, of a campaign in a large scale operation you're about to undertake. It's very important that you get that accurately done. It is not just an intel officer's duty to do that. Commanders have got to second guess everything they're coming with. In Desert Storm, the, the Iraqi forces were described as being very large, true, well-trained, very skilled in defensive ops. They defend behind strong obstacles and have huge mobile reserves that'll just come in and counter any penetration. The facts were that the army that the Big Red One faced wasn't quite that good. His units were not very well-trained the 26th Iraqi Division in my front was at 60% strength, short rations, 
and I'll say short water, they literally were out of water, and the defensive position was poorly prepared and the obstacle was not quite what we thought we were going to face. But as units were micromanaged, decisions were held on a very high level. The absence of a non-commissioned officer corps and junior leaders have no initiative to counter what's in front of them. So the units all become frozen in place. As I encountered his reserve forces on that night at 2200, I found his units also frozen in place and not prepared to defend the positions that they were in. And I'm sure the United States Air Force had a little bit to do with that. But they were not out there that night. Okay, they weren't there that night. It was us and them. And what happened, they had no night ops skills. This magnificent, great, wonderful T-72 that I've been reading about for 25 years did not have a night capability beyond 500 meters. Our well-trained tank gunners were killing tanks at 2,500 meters, 39 out of 40 rounds. The tow gunners weren't missing. They were killing tanks. They were defeated decisively because of the well-trained soldiers that were in our force to the boss's point of a trained and ready army. Now back to the original point. I submit to you if the intel estimate of the enemy had been a little bit more accurate, that maybe I and maybe the Corps commander would have chose to fight this just a little differently. Maybe not, but we may have. But I think this overestimate of the enemy is very good to get your guys razor sharp so they're not overconfident. But at the same time, we, I sort of didn't expect them to react the way they did. Second thing, plan for success. Always plan for success. In a big scale operation, you must plan one and two operations ahead of the one you're executing. You gotta have branches and sequels that will allow you and your subordinates to react to orders on the move. Make dead gum sure if you've got control measures that your subordinates understand them and can react in terms of those control measures to go do what, what you want done. When we got that order at 2200 hours that night, we had, a, we had sort of talked, we had talked about a plan to go engage the Republican Guard, but nobody said pass through the second ACR en route to do that. But we did it on the move and it worked out quite well. Presence. I would say command on the battlefield of the commander is, is absolutely essential to the soldiers and the, and the guys you're working for. You gotta get out of your CP and get forward. You gotta be where you can influence the action. Remember now, the 1st Infantry Division is coming out of Fort Riley, Kansas. All our super red hot new modern equipment is in the pumpkin stocks because that's where we're going to fight the Russians. <laughs> we're in the Middle East, coming out of Saudi Arabia into Iraq. I've got the same Vietnam series radios in my equipment that I had when I was a captain in Vietnam. Of course, they were a little bit upgraded, but still, FM. So you got to be forward where you can talk to your commanders and uh, thing. the other things, commander's intent, boss mentioned it. Make sure your subordinates understand it because in the confusion of battle, they must go forward and do what you wanted them to do in the absence of you being there to tell them. If they understand what you want, They'll get it done for you. Logistics. In large maneuver formations, logistics will determine whether you succeed or fail. Logistics planning, in my view, is as important as your tactical ops. For an infantry officer, you've got to understand something. Fuel is your pacing item, not strength and energy and water. Fuel. And your major consumer in an armored formation is the M1 tank. That's the one you gotta watch because it will determine the time you've got to move and when you gotta refuel. But logistics planning is essential to it. And the last, last comment uh, I would make is um, there is simply no equal to a well-trained American soldier led by hard-nosed NCOs and competent junior officers. The reason for our success in Desert Storm, I submit, 
rest on the shoulders of the young men and women that pushed that fuel across that desert, manned those turrets, and manned all the things that had to get done. They were trained, they were ready, and they represented America and did everything we wanted done. If we keep them that way, not to worry. They'll do for you what you always expected. Duty first. John? But the fact is, I'm going to be a little bit redundant in a couple of things. One, wisdom means old. When he said what wisdom, that's old. But, 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 but the fact is, is that there are two absolutes, and the absolute during Desert Shield, Desert Storm, the preparation since the end of the Vietnam War were non-commissioned officers and soldiers, period. And that's, that's what made things happen. And each commander has said that a number of times. Uh, I took command of the 1st Cav in July and was called uh, 1 August to deploy the division to Saudi Arabia in, starting in September 1st. We closed the division, uh, three, three combat brigades, a core support uh, brigade out of uh, Fort Carson, Colorado, about 22,000 folks. Like uh, Tom, uh, my equipment was in Pompkis. And at that time, the Army was through, going through a lot of austerity. And I can tell you very clearly, we had to rebuild equipment from the ground up. We got to Saudi Arabia and closed the division in pieces over time in the Dharan, moved out to a place called Nowhere in the middle of the desert. And I say that because that's a lesson learned. One of the things that, that you really have to train when you think about large-scale operations, we're not going to be in buildings. You have to train field craft. And non-commissioned officers and junior officers trained field craft. So that's a lesson learned. So we deployed about 22,000, 23,000 folks. And I was immediately chopped to the 18th Airborne Corps, where we were in a defensive mode uh, while we were waiting for uh, the rest of the deployers to close on uh, Saudi Arabia. We trained from the end of September until till February, and during that time, I had the opportunity to be part of the 18th Corps, and I was honored to do that, be, par be partners with Barry McCaffrey, be partners with Benny P, and go into defensive mode with that, those light, light units, third ACR, in defensive mode. At the same time, we were training every day, training how to jump over fire trenches with tanks and, and the like. Uh, at the same time, we were getting different missions as we were going down the road. So our first mission was defend. And we were getting threat information, of course, that the, the Iraqis were going to attack in Saudi Arabia. So with the 101st Airborne and the 1st Cav, we set up a very large defensive position uh, with a brigade of the 101st. The, the second mission we received, we received the mission of deceiving the Iraqi forces that we were going to attack straight up the Wadi al-Batan. And in that case, attacking up the Wadi al-Batan, uh, we conducted offensive operations across the Wadi uh, into Iraq two days before G-Day. And that's where the 1st Cav suffered its uh, first casualties and, and first losses. And, I'll talk about that at the very end. We then were chopped to 7th Corps. And one of the things we must remember is this was a coalition fight. During that fight, in the defense along the Iraqi-Saudi Arabian border, I was working with Egyptian forces, Syrian forces. Syrian forces and Egyptian forces were crossing. We were passing through Egyptian forces, or they were passing through us to go in the attack. And it was a coalition fight. And it was, a, it was a, an outstanding operation from that perspective in that working with the coalition was a, another great honor. We did the deception. We continued to do that. We then went into CENTCOM Reserve while we were looking to hold those four divisions in, up to Wadi al-Batan. And then on uh, 26, I think it was 26 of February, uh, we got the order to uh, join 7th Corps in the end of the round. Now, there are a couple things 
uh, that I'll say, and they've al already been said. One is you got to be at the critical place all the time. Secondly, you got to train to fight all the time, and we did that. And when I say train to fight, it's just not meaning training to fight. It means you have to have standards that you meet every day from the individual to the collective. So before we left Fort Hood, battalion and brigade commanders had to qualify every individual on every per individual weapon and every crew-mounted weapon to include tanks, Bradleys, rifles, mortars, artillery, etc. Everyone said it, but the fact is, is that in maneuver, large-scale maneuver, logistics has to be agile, without a, without a doubt. One of the things I learned from Butch Saint when I was in the 1st Armored Division, he started what, I, what we recognize now as Army Doctrine, but refuel on the move. That's what allowed us to move 300 kilometers in 24 hours. After the 1st Battalion, I had 5,000-gallon tankers with all these hoses attached to them that we would refuel to time and keep moving. So agile logistics. General Frank said, understand intent. You're much better off now than we were then. But I will tell you, if then the subordinate commanders did not understand your intent clearly and could execute without further instructions, when communications broke down, we'd still be in the parking lot somewhere. Because the fact of the matter is, with the MSE system, which is the old system, of course, that some of you remember, that thing was not very mobile. And you ran out of FM range very quickly, so understanding intent. They've all talked about branches and sequels. I call it what-if drills. You got to do what-if drills. You got to understand what happens next. Plan for the best. Hope for the best. Plan for the worst. Simple as that. Command presence is important. And they've talked about that. Get out of your CP. Be at the right place at the right time. The critical point to command. And train field craft. What do you do in a division when you're in the middle of nowhere, there's not a latrine in sight, you have no tents because you didn't deploy with tents, and you have to stay there for four to six months waiting for the rest of the folks to close? And what do you folks know what to do? Well, a lot of lessons that those of us who served in Vietnam, uh, we had to create our own latrines. You had to, we used Bedouin tents for a while. Well, a Bedouin, Bedouin tent, I will just tell you, goes up like a, a match, matchbook. So it's all field craft, non-commissioned officer business. That's what, how we solved the situation. So at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it was a great successful coalition operation with our allies who supported uh, the activity. But at the end of the day, I will tell you that the true test is when you look yourself in the mirror and you've lost one or more soldiers, you have to ask yourself, did I do all I could to make sure that they were capable of doing their job? That's the true test of command. Did you do all you could? Did your subordinate leaders do all they could? Did the NCOs do all they could? Because you're responsible as a commander. So from my perspective, I was honored to command the 1st Cav. I would have traded everything else to stay there for a couple more years instead of going on to do staff jobs. And it was great working not only with these division commanders, but with Gary Luck, who was the 18th Airborne Corps commander, Barry McCaffrey, Benny P, and all the commanders of the 18th Airborne Corps. So with that, uh, I'll cut it short. Questions are more important than homilies. Thanks a lot. <laughs> well, from my, my perspective, uh, and I got to deal with a number of different uh, country divisions, and of course, General Franks, uh, we had uh, the first uh, UK armored division. The coordination in advance, the discussions in advance, understanding what each, each uh, command was going to do, what their mission was, and working with them to make sure it was as transparent as you possibly can get. In that environment, because most of the time we were working in the dark, in that environment, 
coordination and communication is the only thing that will work because, in my view, when you looked at the closure of forces, we weren't all there sitting out there waiting together. We closed at different times. So you really had to communicate, coordinate as you got closure, closure of forces. That's my perspective. I would also say uh, with the 1st UK Armored Division, we, we exchanged liaison officers and radios so that we could communicate uh, and get that function going. The other thing I would say is any, anytime you're operating with an ally uh, on a tactical op, uh, rehearse it. There is nothing like a rehearsal. Now, when we rehearsed, it wasn't two majors out there rehearsing the passage of lines. General Rupert Smith was standing there, and I was standing there. The brigade commanders were standing there, and we were talking about a detailed divisional passage of lines of a British division through an American division over an obstacle that we had cleared. So I think rehearsals also reinforce the communication and coordination that General Talele is talking about, when you can do it. It's, it's interesting. I'll tell you a little anecdote, because it was, we were we were in a defensive position, and the Syrians were on my left, and I was here, and the Egyptians were on my right, and the Syrian division was going to pass in front of us. And I got a call from John Yosak, who was the, remember the Syrian divisions had T-72s and, and BMPs. <laughs> so I get a call from General Yosak. It was the middle of the night. He said, John, if you shoot up one of those tanks, pack your bags, you're going home. <laughs> I got the message. <laughs> got, uh, when I, I think a lot of the coalition cooperation and, and teamwork you've already heard about. Uh, when, when we received the order for the first British Army Division to become come under the tactical control of of Seventh Corps. I sat down with, uh, with General Sir Peter de Villiers, who was a senior British officer in, in the coalition. And we agreed on the terms of employment of that division. That, for example, I would not break up the division into parts and place them under operational control of anybody, they, of anybody else. They would be employed as a division. There were, there were a number of those. General Smith was in on that conversation. It was just the three of us. There were no lawyers, contract people, or any of that stuff present. <laughs> there were just professional soldiers yeah, looking each point. other in the, in the eye and trusting each other and saying, me saying to Peter, that's what you, that's what you want, that's what's going to happen. And that did happen. And so there's a, there's, there's a demonstrated trust back and forth. There was a trust back and forth between the Big Red One and the 1st British Army Division in terms of a passage of lines through a 24-lane breach, artillery fire. The 142nd Artillery Brigade, the Arkansas National Guard. Anybody here from Arkansas? OK. Uh, you know, around America, we have different dialects, OK? And, and, uh, we, we have one where I grew up about 60 miles east of here called the Pennsylvania Dutch, Pennsylvania <laughs> Germans, uh, different accents here and there. And so communications between 142nd and the British, uh, uh, they talk, talk to me later about that. <laughs> so, uh, but there's, there's uh, soldiers in, in a mission <clears throat> uh, united together uh, with a case of the British for the first time uh, since North Africa, we're together in the desert. We all understood the history of all that. And there was extraordinary uh, camaraderie and a closeness there with the British 1st Armor Division that just overcame any possible uh, obstacle to coordination. Uh, with the, uh, our joint partners, as I said, with, with our Air Force, uh, we had some disagreements on deep interdiction targets and priorities of those. Uh, some of that caused by there not really being a, a uh, land component commander who was, uh, could directly speak to the air component commander, in this case, General Chuck Horner, who uh, was an old friend of mine. We had served together as colonels. 
when I was at Tradoc and he was over at Langley Air Force Base Tactical Air Command. Uh, so we had a few disagreements on priority of attack deep interdiction. In Europe, in part of NATO, we used a term called battlefield air interdiction, and CENTCOM did not use that, so that was a bit of an adjustment. But close air support, as I mentioned in the talk, we had 348 close air support. We had all the air we needed, and then some, most of that uh, during daylight hours. So joint was, was not a problem. And the coalition was a matter of building teamwork, uh, trust, and, uh, and then go ahead and execute and make it happen in accordance with, with the intent. We got tremendous support from the Bundeswehr before we left Germany. This was a big deal because they secured all of the installations that we had within the Spearhead Division sphere. Uh, the 5th Panzer Division in particular, uh, they did so many things for the families and took care of them so well that, uh, that sometimes the families could even say enough. You all have done more than enough for us. Thanks a lot. Very important factor for us leaving the families in the rear like that. And it's hard to believe that today, but in terms of the dangers that there might have been, but we really thought there might be some problems there. The other thing is, is I actually, because I was a high number division in the formation, I always sat next to Rupert Smith, the, the, the British officer, and I had to interpret for him in many cases. <laughs> particularly when it came to acronyms, some of which I didn't even know. So uh, we had fun with that. You know, one of the things that, for the artillerymen here, and it's, it's lost in history an awful lot, General Franks in 7th Corps, uh, as we were doing the deception up the Wadi, conducted the largest MLRS, MLRS strike and cross-flot operations with aviation, I think, ever in history. Every MLRS unit in theater was firing that one night, followed by attack helicopters that crossed to deceive that five divisions that we were coming straight up. And that's lost in history an awful lot when we think about the, not only the value of artillery, but also how you employ uh, artillery in, in many different ways. So I want to make sure General Franks uh, uh, didn't lose that nugget because he is really responsible for that and it was a such a well-coordinated operation, not only well-coordinated in execution, but well-coordinated on once you fire, how do you uh, mitigate any counterfire that might occur. So a lot of moving parts. Let me tell you what, uh, I brought along here, uh, every unit publishes one of these, it's called Desert Jayhawk. And we did it right after the end of the war. And so uh, in the front of that, as, as any commander would, I, I wrote a, a piece in there. And I said, and I anticipated some of that. <laughs> no matter what is written, said, or shown about what happened, this is to the soldiers. Your courage, heart, toughness, teamwork, and willingness to take the fight to the enemy without let up in bad weather, day and night, will remain forever stamped in the desert sands of Iraq and Kuwait. We will forever remember our fellow soldiers who gave the last full measure of their lives in service to our nation. It is to their memory that we dedicate this book. So, yeah, there's always going to be a lot of that. Uh, some of it's factually incorrect, and I've pointed that out in other places in, in the book I did with Tom Clancy for me personally. Just factually incorrect about uh, conversations I had with the theater commander and, and that we were going to turn the 1st British Armored Division south and attack south down the Wadi towards where John Tillery was. That totally false, totally incorrect, never said. Uh, matter of fact, it was based off of suggesting that maybe, maybe there could be an opening of that a corridor that would ease the Third Army's logistics issues that they knew they would have a uh, big logistics challenge when Kuwait City was liberated. That's what that was all about. It had nothing to do with, with 7th Corps uh, except the suggestion that maybe we could send a unit to do that. And in fact, I was totally dead set against that. So that, that was totally false. The fact that 
right after the first briefing, for example, that I couldn't do the mission without the support of the 1st Cavalry Division, and that's totally erroneous. That was never said. So, you know, a lot of that, a lot of that happens. Yeah, it's a little more than disingenuous. It's just flat wrong, incorrect, shouldn't have been said, shouldn't have been put in books. And I, I, I didn't like it then, don't like it now, resented it ever since, uh, because it was factually incorrect. And so uh, I, I felt, as a commander, uh, when I was out talking to one of General Funk's uh, units, uh, just right before we attacked, I was busily explaining our attack maneuver and how we would catch the Iraqis by surprise, which we did. And a non-commissioned officer stopped me in the middle of a little bit too long an explanation and said, don't worry, General, we trust you. And uh, my throat closed over, and uh, I, I hesitated. I almost didn't know what to say. I was, I was uh, overcome with, a, with emotion because that NCO captured, as non-commissioned officers frequently do, when we're willing to listen to them, the very essence of combat leadership. What we hope for. To earn and then sustain the trust of those entrusted to us by the way we prepare them, and the way we command and, and lead them and their subordinates in the operation where we're going to ask everything from them, and they're going to give back everything and then some back to the mission. So it's fulfillment of that trust. And I know I felt personally, as well as all my fellow veterans here, that we did our very, very best to fulfill that trust to those entrusted to our command. So when these slings and arrows fly around, disingenuous things, uh, I tell you, they just, they just bounce off. And if you, if you want somebody with a determination and it doesn't let things like that bother you, put somebody in command of an armor corps that's walking around in a prosthetic leg from a previous war, and then you know why little stuff like that doesn't bother you. <laughs> You know, the other thing I'd say in regard to that is uh, <clears throat> I don't know of any fight in our history anyhow, not that I've studied them all because I haven't, but I don't know where we've ever achieved surprise. Surprise, remember, Frederick the Great said it was always, it was permitted to be defeated but never permitted to be surprised, and he was a hard old goat. At the strategic level, I don't think Saddam Hussein ever thought the United States Army would deploy forces to the Middle East and then start bombing it. At the, at the, the operational level, they never dreamed we could move forces like 7th Corps, and by the way, 18th Corps, they moved out ahead of us. But in that short a period of time, move an entire corps to the western flank and attack two days later. They didn't expect that. And third, I know the tactical surprise. The first battalion commander that we captured when they interrogated him, and most of the guys spoke English, he said, where the hell did you guys come from? <laughs> Basically, we thought you were at least three or four hours away. Now, that's tactical surprise, folks. If you ever achieve that again on a battlefield, you'll be very fortunate and sold your soldiers. So, yep, there were probably some armchair quarterbacks, they were the same ones that said we'd, we'd fail to start with, but there are those out there. But the facts are, it was an overwhelming victory. And so, uh, you bet. I think uh, enough said about that. And also remember that the President of the United States defined the mission as liberate Kuwait. He didn't say do anything else. No, five he said, objectives. said liberate Kuwait and restore the legitimate government back in ruling power. And we did that. And by God, I submit we did it. <laughs> by, by the way, kudos to President Bush 41, my, per, my personal presidential hero from every the time I started thinking about that kind of stuff. He was very clear. And I spoke once to General Powell about it. He said the hardest, the toughest one of us all, the national security team, which I thought 
was terrific at the time. He said the toughest was the president. He was the firmest and he was the clearest in his guidance. And nobody asked anymore after that, after the last few years, why the hell we didn't go to Baghdad, did they? Yeah, I, I brought along with me the declassified uh, National Security Directive uh, that uh, Tom and Butch are talking about. And it says in here, I hereby authorize military actions designate, designed to bring about Iraq's withdrawal from Kuwait. This authorization is for the following purposes. To effect the immediate, complete, and unconditional withdrawal of all Iraqi forces from Kuwait. And then there's three others. And the last, the last uh, sentence, that's paragraph two. The last sentence says, military operations will come to an end only when I have determined, President, that the objectives set forth in paragraph two above yeah. have been met. Period. That is Pretty clarity clear. of purpose. <laughs> Damn that straight. is clarity of purpose. <laughs> You know, if this <clears throat> presence, I talked to you about presence, everybody from the division commander, corps commander down, are circulating about the units all the time, talking to their people. I, I remember asking a, a, a driver in an M1 tank, I said, we think about all them mines out there. He said, sir, I don't think about them. He said, see, sir, he said, Sergeant, whatever his name was up there. I said, yeah. He said, if he's going, I'm going with him. Mm -hmm. See, the chain of command circulating about the battlefield are instilling confidence and motivation in the soldiers that know they're trained and they know they're ready. But if the commanders are not visible and the commanders are not present, and the, pre and the commanders are not prepared to go with them, they're not going to be motivated, but they will be if, you, if you're present and let them know you're with them. I believe that. Uh, okay, we deployed in September, and our, our G day was the 24th of February versus the 26th. There's nothing that focuses uh, soldiers and non-commissioned officers better than knowing that one day they're going to have to cross the border of Saudi Arabia and Iraq and go on the attack. So there was no morale problems. I mean, the fact of the matter is, we were training every day. We built uh, Table 8 and Table 12 ranges in the desert in Wadis. Uh, we had uh, special ammunitions, which we had to disseminate and work. We traded, we traded out, and I give credit to the Acquisition Corps for this, we traded out every M1 tank for an M1A1 tank at Dauron Port and every Bradley, because we were bringing the stuff from Fort Hood. It was old, old stuff. We traded it all out. We went out and trained it all up. And we were doing drills, and brigade, battalion, and, and, and non-commissioned officers were out there training every day. We knew what we had to do. The biggest, the biggest morale booster, and you don't have to worry about that today, the biggest morale booster was when ATT came in with a a bank of telephones on a low boys and gave us one week right. to send 23,000 folks so they can make a 15 minute call. Mm -hmm. That was the biggest morale boost and the turkeys for Thanksgiving, which was one of the logistics challenges that we had from September to November. But other than that, uh, I will tell you, the, fo the focus was there. Our troops, our troops and non-commissioned officers made it happen, period, yep. period. And it was something that uh, we knew we had to do. The biggest question before deployment, because we knew we were deploying for a longer period of time, was how long you think, well, you, you go to every battalion and you say, okay, here's what we're going to do, here's what we're going to deploy. The first question that always came up is how long are you going to be there? And the answer was beat the hell out of me, yeah. but I would plan on at least a year. <laughs> Fortunately, it was only eight, eight and a half months. Yeah, I, uh, I heard a <clears throat> soldier talk in an interview with Sam Donaldson, then of ABC News, interviewing a tank company, happened to be in the 1st Armor Division. And a soldier, a PFC, said, they asked for our help. We're going to give them that help. We're going to go free their country. And then we're going to go home and carry on with life. That's the same thing it says right. that I just read you. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, so, so it's that knowledge, talking with soldiers, 
their motivations to, to go do what the country asked them to do. And magnificent. I mean, it just waters your eyes to be around soldiers and non-commissioned officers like that, just like you all have served with in this war, and plenty of evidence to see, to see that in this 18-year war the United States of America has been involved in, in both Iraq twice and, uh, and Afghanistan continuously. So you, there you was know, so, so the, there's a lot of self-motivation there that, that happens. I mean, there, there was one, one thing I, I should say I caused a morale problem. And it was my problem and the brigade commanders that we insisted that any time any was within a military vehicle, and you know, it was about 120 degrees, they had to wear their hard hat. So, you know, we get all sorts of uh, sidebar comments, the first Kevlar division rather than the first cavalry <laughs> division. But, but, but the, the fact is, the first accident on Tap Line Road where someone knocked their head through the windshield of a five-ton truck, that was the end of that conversation. Yeah. Everybody <laughs> kept their hard hats on. But that was a morale thing. I will tell you, when they were in base camp, of course, uh, uh, they could wear their soft caps, but that, that was a morale thing that I caused myself. Please. Well, I, I think the first thing is, is it, it's pretty obvious, uh, and, and it's, a great, it's a great question and a point, but remember we had a desert in the United States called the Mojave, and the National Training Center, and nearly every soldier, not necessarily all the senior guys, but nearly every soldier in the period of time, the years, that fi over the 15 years that General Franks mentioned, that built up, had gone through that process in that desert. And so there was some familiarity in terms of terrain. My own concern about that, though, was it's a mighty big open uh, broad desert, and I was a little worried coming from Germany that the guys might be a little overwhelmed by that when they got on the ground. And so we did talk about that and try to deal with questions on it. The fact is, is that all of our training uh, prior to, which I described briefly earlier, where we rotated through every weapons system and then all up through the task force level, the brigade level really, of operations at Hohenfels, all of that training still pertained and still helped us. Um, where we felt there might be some there, there might be some concerns was with the the training because of language uh, or because of religious differences and feelings. I think everybody knows uh, that we were welcomed into the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. By the way, I spent three years there as a civilian later. Um, and so I think I understand a little bit about the culture and so on. But we knew that we were going to have to really watch ourselves, be very careful, and try not to offend folks. That's also one of the reasons why we moved to the desert as quickly as we could, you know. Get the guys and gals, get out, get into the desert, and there we set up, and there we worked. And we worked with some very fine officers and leaders from the other from the other nations, as was mentioned earlier. Uh, but there was, there, we were pretty sensitive about that. And by the way, so was the president. And that's why he said, we're coming home and this is over. Because he didn't want to stir up problems. He had talked with the king. He had visited with the senior leaders. Uh, Prince Bandar uh, uh, bin Sultan was then the ambassador in, in the United States. And he was close to the Bush family. And I think he had very capably described that we needed to be very careful there with that. We never got it all done, but we did have a plan for that, and we felt like we were going there not as invaders, not as invaders, but people coming to restore a country and its government. And that's what the president very clearly said in his message. And I think, I think that proved to be true, but could have had some real problems with some of those things, Fortunately, we did not. One thing that, that I think General Funk raised, which is very important, I think, as we think of the future, and that's the cultural sensitivity, which includes a wide parameter of, of various issues. And when we went into, the, into uh, the desert, before we went and after we went, we had 
at different levels, uh, cultural, for lack of a better description, sensitivity. So we would not offend uh, the indigenous uh, folks. We are well received. We dealt with uh, many leaders uh, within uh, the various provinces within uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. And, and I will just tell you that they were as welcoming as you can ever imagine. And, and the, the issue of understanding the culture before you get to a place, I think is very important for every leader and to a certain degree, every service member who's going. You bet. The, the other thing uh, that I worried about in, in on that subject was navigation. That <laughs> desert is so vast that it, it was a little bit scary to me. <laughs> but a, a, play, a guy called Magellan suddenly arrived. <laughs> And I, and I, but I bring this to your attention because in large formations, if you're not oriented correctly by battalion and brigades, the fratricide possibility are, are enhanced exponentially. Yep. Because the range and lethality of the current tow and the current 120 millimeter gun is unbelievably accurate and unbelievably devastating. But GPS is, was a wonderful thing. And remember something. First Infantry Division has never seen a GPS Neither had we, Tom. until Magellan arrived yep. from Los Angeles, California. All of us. All right. of us. No one had. That's nope. right. Nope. Nobody had seen. This is a new technology. We've never seen hard it before. To it's hard to believe. We, I know. We had it's true. Uh, but it, it really, it's really one of the things that I believe it exponentially reduced fratricide in the Gulf War. Agreed. Yeah. I, I believe that. The, change of conditions for us from Central Europe or even from Fort Riley or from, from Fort Hood to, to that set of physical conditions uh, gives you some training challenges in the theater that you can't practice uh, other places. And navigation was a huge one. Long range gunnery was another. We used service ammunition. Yep. So called at the time, uh, 120 millimeter cannon silver bullet because it was colored that way, painted that way. 829 and, uh, and soldiers got an enormous amount of confidence from that, what, seeing the effects of that silver bullet sable round tank, 120 millimeter sable round. The navigation, as we got fielded to GPS, and we didn't, I think we had over a little over 3,000 of them in the whole Corps, which wasn't a whole lot. Uh, but the ability to navigate, I remember going, getting in my 113 myself and, and using a compass dead reckoning to <laughs> find Tom Raym and go take a look at what they were doing with their, their breach uh, training operations. And uh, just to get a sort of a, what the Germans call the finger spitzing get fuel, a, right. a feel for navigation in the desert. My, my own calibration of time distance factors was, was pretty good from uh, service in Central Europe and not too bad in the desert either from service at Fort Bliss, Texas in the 3rd Cavalry. Uh, but I needed to recalibrate myself as we all did for that terrain True. over there. And we did, we had a little time uh, to be able to do that and the GPS helped enormously. One of the Iraqis that was captured uh, said, uh, how did you navigate through all that rain, sandstorm, rain? Had, rain. Uh, said, we, we get lost out there. And uh, one, of our, one of our troops showed him a GPS. And uh, that really explained a lot of the navigation, yeah. uh, solved a lot of the navigation issues. For I'd probably still be there if it hadn't been so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Thanks. Say so one over here. I can, I can give you a couple of views because I happen to be fortunate enough to, that since we organized the place, they let us sit in on the talks. I believe that at the time that the ceasefire negotiations were going on, uh, two men, General Colin Powell and uh, General Schwarzkopf, probably figured all that out, which, as you know, a lot of people say it's not a soldier's duty, but that's just the way it got done. Uh, 
he had his instructions written out on a three by five card. And I can tell you with absolute certainty that as he began to talk, the Iraqi senior officer did not have a clue of what had happened to his army. The first question was from John Schwarzkopf was, we insist that American and Kuwaiti prisoners and all Allied prisoners be returned to us immediately. And the man said, yes. And then there was just silence. And then he said, would you not like some of yours back? And he said, oh, you have prisoners? <laughs> we had probably, what, Thousands of them. We had 46,000 no, prisoners. We had 46,000 prisoners. They had no concept of, of uh, how that was going. Uh, anything beyond what I observed, I'll defer to John Franks because I don't, I don't know anything else that happened. No, I uh, much after the war, I, I went as part of the book I did in Quincy. I went, I went, I interviewed General Powell and talked to him a lot about the maneuver and and the end of the war. And, and back to the uh, National Security Directive, I, I truly believe that. Uh, given the theater commander's public briefing uh, and the report back to uh, General Powell, his report to President Bush, that the objectives had been achieved, that is the liberation of Kuwait and the Iraqi army in such a state that they would be no threat to, to uh, Kuwait again or anybody else in the region for that matter, uh, had been achieved led the president to uh, authorize the ceasefire and then to charge General Schwarzkopf to conduct the ceasefire talks there at Safwan. Actually, we were asked to uh, suggest places for the ceasefire talks. Uh, our own suggestion, I, I had asked around the Corps, our suggestion was to do it out in the middle of the desert where there was a lot of destruction, like right in the middle of the Tawakana Division, which had ceased to exist. Yeah. And so let's do it right there where, you know, like, like there was visible effects of the total destruction of the Iraqi army. And, Good call. and he decided for one reason or another to do it there at, at Safwan, which we didn't have at the time. And I ordered Tom Raymond to go on up there and take it without firing a shot, which was one of the great maneuvers of the, of the war, I think. But I, I sat in the tent with uh, General Schwarzkopf and the, and, the, and the ceasefire talks and a second what Tom said. And then when, when General Schwarzkopf called back to uh, General Powell on the phone, and then he also uh, talked to uh, General Yoshak about the results, he said, Freddie, sit here and take some notes. He said, I, I want to make sure I don't miss anything. And so I, I heard all of that, at least from his perspective. And it was very clear about the, uh, the ceasefire conditions, the separation of forces, uh, and so forth. So I, I think there was, was pretty good clarity there at the end. Uh, strategic conditions evolved after that. Uh, you know, the no-fly zones and all the rest of that, the uh, humanitarian mission in, uh, in northern Iraq. But I, I think the, the war was, the, the first Gulf War was terminated at the right time when these national security objectives were achieved and the proper communications uh, happened between the combatant commander and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the president speaking on behalf of the coalition and consistent with uh, the UN resolutions that have been passed and consistent with his discussion with most of the, yeah. most of the heads of state and yeah. all the rest of the coalition. Yeah. And I think in the judgment of President Bush, uh, and I've spoken, I've heard him talk about this at one of our Seventh Corps reunions uh, and been in communication with him uh, right up to his death uh, last year, but uh, that, that he made the, the absolute right call. And I often wondered uh, to myself, what, what would I have written home to the family members of a, one of our service members who would have been killed or seriously wounded 
if we had continued operation for no, no particular purpose out of the bounds of our own national security directive or out of the bounds of UN resolutions or out of the bounds of, of what the coalition had agreed to. And so I think we were all of one mind that, that the right thing happened and uh, the talks were held and the right conditions were established. Right as that diagram I showed you with the uh, first cab coming around from the north of the first armor division, the big red one coming up from the south, uh, that was in 7th Corps. But then 18th Corps had been rapidly moving east when we, we uh, ordered, when I ordered Frag Plant 7, turned 7th Corps east 90 degrees, it opened up a boundary for 18th Corps to attack west to east. Otherwise, uh, we would have pinched them out. And so you had a third army, 7th Corps, 18th Corps, attacking west to east. You also had air, but there was no really air ground controlling element to do the interdiction to seal off the theater, which we thought really was going to happen to seal off the crossings of the Euphrates while uh, in sort of an anvil effect in, in the 18th Corps and 7th Corps would be to hammer up against that air interdiction uh, uh, anvil, so to speak. And in the absence of any controlling element forward to control the air and the ground attack, that was very difficult to, to manage in the last uh, hours of the, of the campaign and, and really never happened. So there was some of the Republican guards, because of that, uh, were able to leave the theater. I would only say uh, two, a couple of things. One, uh, this is very appropriate considering the national security strategy. Large-scale operations are the thing when we think about peer threats. When you think about it, in today's environment, you ought to be looking at what happened when the Russians attacked Ukraine, how long it took for them to take down uh, a brigade of armored Ukrainian forces. You've got things to cope with. We didn't. Cyber. Big deal. You're going to have to cope with it. Uh, and I, I think the, the other thing, when you think about it, you think of, need to think about where you might be in the world. Everything from uh, the Republic of Korea defending uh, that great democracy to somewhere in Europe uh, defending the democracies there or fighting for our, our nation. So you've got great challenges. Uh, I envy you who are here today. And uh, God bless you all. God bless America. Thanks for the opportunity to talk to you. The only other thing I would add is uh, Dr. Lee, as, uh, as you grow in stature, you've got courage to put two corps on the ground, put an Army component commander in command of them. I'm speaking from our corps commander, division commanders, we respond to him. But if you've got an army component commander you can directly relate to with command presence, ops take a, take a lot easier view uh, than they do. Uh, I served uh, as 10 years as chairman of your foundation here at this college. This institution is a national treasure. I hope we've contributed in some small way to your professional growth. You know, some of you in here are going to be big guys, big gals one day. And uh, we wish you the best because you're a lot, hell, a lot smarter than my class was. <laughs> <laughs>
what it is we apply to the war fighting capabilities of the country. <clears throat> this isn't about techies going off on their own. In some cases, they do brilliant things. In others, they do strange things. And you all are aware of that. You have to harness the technology to, to the kinds of battlefield operating systems you have to enhance performance on the battlefield. That's what you do with technology, in my view. And uh, we've had a period of time when we haven't done that very well, except in the field. The guys keep adapting. We got to get a lot better. And I hope that the Chief's new initiatives on the, on the priorities he has and for Futures Command makes that happen. The Army really needs it because we're behind some people out there in the world today. So that's my two cents worth. Thanks a lot. Appreciate your attention. Well, I, I personally want to thank uh, John and Tom and Butch for agreeing to do this. Uh, had first suggested this actually to AUSA, to General Swan, and back in February that while we're still here, perhaps it might be useful to uh, hold some kind of an open symposium on large-scale ground combat operations as the U.S. Army is trying to reestablish uh, those competencies. Uh, Dean, War College, grabbed to that and made this happen. So thank you, General Kim and you Dean Lockamon, and for, for making that happen, for giving us the opportunity to come here and speak to the future of our U.S. Army, for our U.S. Armed Forces here, uh, and for those of you from countries around the world, futures of your, your own armies or your own militaries. I am always uh, go away from these sessions very positive about the future, your own questions, your own uh, uh, background, your own experiences, your own uh, wisdom you've gained in your own careers to this point uh, for the U.S. military fighting in, in this war. And I, I really like to paraphrase uh, Churchill. Uh, for those of you who have combat in this war uh, with your soldiers and an enormous sacrifice for your soldiers and families that never have so many of us owed so much to so few of you in your tenacious uh, persistence and uh, determination uh, to bring these, uh, these wars to a successful conclusion in both Iraq uh, and Afghanistan. So my hat's off to, to all of you of this generation and all of you who've been privileged to, to lead. We've tried to suggest to you today some uh, enduring realities of large scale ground combat operations that we're not, I don't think, advocating a repeat of Desert Storm from 28 years ago, but some enduring realities as you all talk and deliberate and indeed are involved in structuring an army that will be capable of large ground, large scale ground combat operations. So there are some of these enduring realities will apply to you and apply to those studies into those operations. But there's a whole lot that you're going to have to figure out yourselves, and you're capable, certainly capable of doing that. And I want to wish you uh, all the very best at that. For me personally, I treasure my opportunity to be with my fellow commanders, my own uh, opportunity to command 7th Corps 28 years ago in a magnificent soldiers and leaders that were part of that largest armored formation the United States Army has ever fielded. And for me personally, and I, I wrote this, that, that I'd been permitted to return to battle with that army after we had both been badly wounded was something more than I, can, I could ever have dreamed of. And I'm privileged to be here with you today. And thank you very much, and God bless America.